Hi everyone, welcome back to Live Darts. Here we are, build up to Alexandra Palace and the rest of the year. Got broadcaster Dan Dawson. Dan, before we get on to Alexandra Palace, it's been some year culminating in what could be sheer brilliance this Christmas. Yeah, really good. Uh, really good. Um, the World Championship, obviously Van Gogh and the man to beat, but I just genuinely think that the strength and depth in PDC darts over the last few years increased to a degree where you've got players who can have a big, big outcome on the tournament and go deep into it, and there are a load of potential winners. When I first one I covered, sort of 2009, I think it was, Phil Taylor, before the tournament, was saying, I reckon there's probably three or four people who can win the Worlds. I think you're looking at three times that number, realistically. And that's not ruling out that you might have somebody as a bit of an outsider come through. I just think there's so much talent in the game. Euro Tour finished. Is that Euro Tour style that Rob Cross wins the finale before he actually wins a Euro Tour event? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, Rob Cross, he puts the cart before the horse every single thing he's done in his, his career, hasn't he? Um, it's a weird old year with Rob Cross as well. Like, I mean, he's just a weird player. It's a weird career that he's got. This year, he's won two major titles and he's not played particularly brilliant in either of them. I think it's fair to say. They've I been agree. good bits. They've been good bits in those tournaments and good games, but not. He's, he's played better throughout the year and not won anything. Like, he's become the absolute king of losing with 100 average this year, which is not really a good habit to be in. Um, he's, he's a special player and I think people. It's weird, isn't it? Not many people are like looking at Rob Cross going into the Worlds and going, well, he could go and win it again. I agree, he's under the radar Nobody's, at the moment. Yeah, and he's world number two. I know that people are looking at provisional lists and all sorts of stuff for the end, with the money coming off of the Worlds, but he's won two major titles this year. And, and before he won those major titles, it was he looked inevitable he was going to win something. He just found ways to lose. I, I just think he's a, a special talent. <clears throat> but it's about whether he can put it together over these three weeks. He's done it before, why not? Do you still remember the first time that you drove or walked up that hill with Alexandra Palace sat on the top looking over London? It's a special place to play darts, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a properly impressive building. And look, I know, I spent a lot of time at Barnsley Metrodome, so I know what an impressive <laughs> darts venue looks like. But it's there is something special about it. And it was, when I first started doing it, they'd only just moved there. It hadn't bedded in. It hadn't become this figurehead, this cathedral of, of, the, of our sport. Um, but now you've seen it grow. You've seen people coming from all over the world. You've seen a quarter, about a third of the tickets go into fans from Europe who travel over. They make a pilgrimage to come to this place. It really has become synonymous with darts. People talk about the... If you mention the Ali Palace to somebody, it'll inevitably be the darts. And that's not just for darts fans. Of course, the darts fans will do it. But if you speak to anybody outside of darts, if you can imagine doing <laughs> such a thing, Phil, I realise you probably don't anymore. It's no, not yeah. Dan. Yeah, but like, it, it's, it's become an incredible place. Um, and it, it's history that does it, isn't it? Because, you know, you, you've got the memories, you've got those special nights, you've got the special moments, you've got these um, sport-defining weeks and, and spells tournaments that happen, you know, and Rob Cross, what a story, Michael Van Gerwen becoming world champion and, and winning some of the most dominant world championship campaigns we've ever seen, it, and those magical games, you know, and we've got more stories to come, you know, what if we see a Mikuru or whoever comes through the other women's qualifier go and do something, what if we see uh, the first Welsh world champion in PDC darts, that's a, a, a chat, that's a... It's a possibility, isn't it? The way he's playing, you certainly wouldn't write it out. Yeah, going price could as well, never mind the ferry. <laughs> but look, it, there, there's going to be more stories, and Barney going away at the end of uh, the end of his career is, is another story. He's guaranteed, I don't know how it ends, might end pretty sourly, might end very quickly, but it's a story, and that's what those memories are what makes makes us love sport. That's what it's about. Before we get on to this year's tournament, have you got a favourite Alexandra Palace memory as a fan or a broadcaster? Um, the one, it was, it was quite early on actually when I realised that I was working at a ridiculous sport um, Adrian Lewis had won his second world title uh, and myself I'll be there till late at night filing reports and stuff you know what it's like it was before all you social media folks turned <laughs> up just doing like radio stuff um, it'll be me and Dave Allen there till two in the morning or whatever and we'd finished up Right, done. Right, let's get let's get back to the hotel. We can have a drink. We've been working solidly for three hours. Adrian had left his world championship trophy there. He just left it. 
Like he just walked off without it. He's, he's gone and won the biggest title in the game for the second year running. He's just left it. He's just, the big daft lad from Stoke is just <laughs> totally, oh, all right, talk, see you later. Yeah, so we had to we just carrying it across the car park, sticking it in the back of Dave's car, and then walking into the hotel where we were staying and handing it over. It was a second presentation. I got to hand the World Championship trophy to the man who'd won it in front of a big hotel bar full of people who stood and applauded. Uh, it made me feel it made me feel impressive. Nice. It was like, like being that. it was like being Matt Porter for twenty seconds. I like that. Yeah, like that's that nice. yeah, that's good. Look at this year's tournament, I think it's fair to say that Michael Van Gogh and Anne Gowen Price will be the two bookies favourites to mm-hmm. lift the title this year and rightfully so. But Gezzer especially the last six to eight weeks he has been almost unplayable at times. Yeah but the thing is we've seen that before this year. You know, you go back to the, the Pro Tour stuff at the start of the year where he won two in a weekend. Yeah. And, I mean, enormous numbers, 113 averages, 108, 109s, and consecutive games. He was doing that, and he did it all weekend. Now, he's done that again at a couple of times this year. Now he's done it in major tournaments in, in close succession, quick succession, defending his title, the International Darts Open, very impressively. But even when he's not been winning, he's been going quarter-final, semi-final, final. It's just been very impressive. He continues to get better. All the people who are saying he only wins games because he's, you know, because he intimidates opponents and that. Well, they've just shut up now because it's absolute nonsense. You know, like you were telling people it was nonsense. I was telling people it was nonsense. It it's proven to be nonsense. But he is playing amazingly. Gezi really does have a, a real chance. And obviously, beating MVG for the first time is a massive thing for him because they might be on a collision course. Lots been made that MVG's never defended this title. With there's gaps in between. Does that mean anything in your opinion? As a, I don't think so. I mean, look, he'd never won the Champions League of darts, and he won that um, this year. He's he's a guy who breaks records. If it's something he hasn't done, then he goes sets out and does it. And there are some titles that he just wins over and over and over again. I mean, you know, European Championship players, Championship finals, he's won many, many times. I, 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 he's, he's still the best player in the world. I mean, Gerwin is playing absolutely fantastically and who knows whether he can continue uh, that all the way through a very long tournament. Um, but Michael Van Gerwen can. We know Michael Van Gerwen can because Michael Van Gerwen has. And I think... There aren't many people who are now saying, "Oh, he looks a bit vulnerable, doesn't he?" No, he, <laughs> no, he looks. Well, yeah, it? he looks. He looks really good. And so I think it's all set up for an incredible tournament. Another great story this year is the Glendarren story coming over, scraping a tour card. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Now into the top 32 and three televised semi-finals in 11 months is some feat for anyone. Well, look, if he goes and it is, it is some feat. And. I, I kind of liked it. Does a, a world match play? He was obviously gutted, and he was saying, "Don't really." He was gutted to go out in the semi-finals. He said, "Oh, these opportunities that don't come very often. You've got to really, if these opportunities come around, you've got to step up and take them because you might not get it." He's been in two more semi-finals <laughs> since then, in a matter of months. These opportunities do come around when you're as good as Glenn Durren. Yes, I know he's he's, he's just turned forty-nine. I know he's no spring chicken, but Glenn Durren's proved he's a class player and. He's going to be a threat. He'll be a threat in all the tournaments we've played. It's been a, an incredible debut year. Just qualifying for the match play in your first year is impressive. But to then make the semis and back it up, he's going to be so, so tough to beat. And that experience of winning big titles, world titles, it, it's a big thing. It, it's a very, you know, you. you you can't buy it. You can't learn that on the practice board. You've got to go and do it. And Dazza has done it. I, I just—he's another one who's a title threat. Um, and the only way you beat him, usually, the only way you beat him, you've got to throw something world class, hundred average, fifty percent on doubles. A lot of people can do that, but it's not easy. Makura is another story. Mm. Obviously, she's heading to the Alexandra Palace for the first time. But do you think she'll have learnt so much of those three games on the stage at Wolverhampton as an PDC experience, taking it? into this Christmas? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I mean, the thing is with Mikuru, who obviously plays a lot of darts out in Asia, they play a lot of the, the team darts, cricket, and you know teams of four, teams of three, or whatever, and they're playing alongside the men on a regular basis. So I don't think that is an aspect that they need to, to le- that she needs to learn much about. She does need to learn about the environment of being in a PDC tournament, the practice room, but even the Grand Slam and, and Oldsley Leisure Village turned into a pretty decent venue. Good, for it. Yeah, really good. I think people had reservations at first, but it's, it's good. Um, Ali Pali is something different. And you know, Rob Cross, 
he thought he was a major finalist when he went to Ali Pali the first time. He'd made the European Championship final, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be all right. I'll, I'll just, you know, it'd be so I know what I'm doing now. I've been playing TV tournaments and stuff." Came off stage that first time, and he was like, "I was not. You know what? I was not prepared for that. Yeah. I was not." And to be honest, that's probably the weakest he looked in his first game when he that year he yeah. won it. He just got better and better. Um, we'll see how many opportunities Mikuru gets, um, or whoever comes through the other the ladies qualifier. Um, they've got talent, but they're going to have to play somewhere near their top level to have an impact in the tournament. They can do it, but if they if they're off the game in any way, then they probably get beaten. But it's going to be interesting watching this time of year as well. All the Premier League chitter chatter has has now started, like like it always does. Looking at it now, are there certain players that have almost played their way out of Premier League contention? The, due to their TV form in the latter half of the year, I know the worlds can change everything, but at, at the moment, are there a few in danger? Well, I don't think Wayne Mardle's going to get in. I'll say that. I don't, as well as he's playing in, in exhibitions, I just think I just don't think he's done enough uh, to get in. I, I, it's all up for grabs. The World Championship is, is the biggest thing, and it will have the biggest impact on the Premier League selection. Um, I, I'm kind of. I think the biggest questions are about what structure it's going to take. Are we going to have the contenders? Um, and is Gary Anderson interested slash fit enough to commit to playing that number of, of months of consecutive action? Look, Ando puts bums on seats. He's an incredible talent. But we've seen this year, even when he's, he's looked good, he's just lacking a little bit. Playing a few tournaments here and there, ducking in and out, I mean, he's, he's not in mind for the Players' Championship Finals because he hasn't played enough. It's not the same as playing every single week all over Europe, the travelling involved. I, d I genuinely don't know if he's got the stomach for it. You've probably spoken to him. I don't know if he's, if he's said anything, but I, I don't know. It might change his mind what happens at Ali Pali. We're not dark players alike. They'll go, no, I'm not doing that, or yes, I'm doing that. And then something happens over a major tournament, and they go, no, I'll change my mind. So I don't know. That's, that's the big question mark for me. Do we have the contenders? Is Gary Anderson interested? Potentially, it frees up two spots, um, in which case the Premier League looks very, very different. But the, the one I really want to see is Nathan Aspinall in there. Um, I think Nathan Aspinall has done more than enough to get into the Premier League. I think he has been an absolute revelation over the last 12 months. And seeing him play every week in the Premier League, he could do all sorts. It might take him a year. You know, Darrell Gurney was solid in his Premier League debut. Gerwin Price had a bit of a mare in his Premier League Michael debut. Michael Smith. Michael Smith didn't have a good one. doesn't necessarily mean they don't come back later and really show what they're about. There's no coaching manual for the Premier League either, is there? When you listen to all these players that play it for the first time, they're like, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, and it, you know, it's the, the biggest crowds in darts we've seen, apart from that mad World Series event we had in Germany. Uh, and it's just brutal. It's just week after week of, of playing. There aren't any easy games. But if you start poorly, that's the thing. It's, it's so difficult to get out of that mindset. If you lose in the first few weeks, and then you're just thinking, well, have I really got a chance? The mindset changes and it becomes a trudge. It becomes a, a real hard graft just to go around the country thinking... I'm probably not in contention here or I'm going to have to win every single game and the pressure is a lot more and we've seen it with Price, we've seen it with Michael Smith and yet when they win games and then they start well and they're picking up points then the sky's the limit for them. That's why the start of the Premier League is, is so, so important for the rest of the season. Last one from us. Big, big, big World Series news. We are going to the city that doesn't sleep. Mm. But at MSG, that's got quite a ring to it, hasn't it? I mean, look, it, it's... It's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, the World Series in Vegas was superb. From what I understand, speaking to people out there in North America and speaking to people who, you know, you know, speak to Rod Arrington or any of the old boys who used to go and play in North America all the time. The East Coast, you know, Amer uh, New York, uh, Boston. Boston, all that sort of area, that's where there are a lot, a lot of darts players. Obviously, Canada's massively represented. I'm hoping... It just gets more interest. Yes, of course. Look, going to New York would be incredible. I've never been to New York. I'm hoping I go to go. I might not. But <laughs> I, if not, I'll be watching with interest on the telly. But if if it gets more North Americans interested, the whole point of the World Series is to find the next generation of players. There are some good young American players. Danny Baggish might 
be a very good player because some of the numbers he's been posting have been very, very eye-catching. But there's other players, like Danny lorby has been around, who's kind of been unearthed by the World Series. We haven't seen him do a great deal yet. But let's find some more of those. Let's go and find an Adam Gowlas in Kentucky <laughs> or something. I don't know. But that's what the whole World Series is about, finding talent. Going to New York for the first time, yes, it's going to be very glitzy, it's going to be very glamorous, but ultimately, the nuts and bolts of it is, we want some American dart players, and if it helps find some talent, everybody wins. Dan, absolute pleasure, and we shall see you first day at Alexandra Palace for a long slog in the Big Brother house. All the way through, pal.